Welcome to Robo Weekly. Welcome to Robo Weekly. We've made it to episode three, and I'd like to welcome my co-host, Dan. Dan Saw. Hi, Dan. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Good, good. Uh, so this is our third episode, can you believe it? Episode number three. Wow. What it's does amazing. the number three mean to you? It's almost pie. Almost pie. Well, I just lost 20 bucks to our producer. I thought you were going to say it's prime, but never mind. Um, uh, it's two more episodes than is necessary. Double redundancy, so that's good. Okay, everybody, sweepstakes. Here's the deal. We are going to give away one of our products to one of our channel subscribers. So, you know, I don't want to be sort of uh, uh, only friends about it, but if you can gently depress the subscribe button below, you have at this point a one in 135 chance of winning a robot, which is pretty good. So please press that. Also, um, if you comment, um, the best use case will win a robot from us and we will endeavor to reply to every use case comment that we see below. Thank you for allowing me to say that. Anyway, let's let's jump right in. We've got a new segment, which we're going to start off now, which is called Ethical Explorations. So, Dan, I'm going to ask you three questions, serious questions. Right. Um, you've not been prepared with these. Let's nope. do the first one. Do you believe that it's ethical to replace limbs with superior versions? Sure. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily let them in the Olympics, but um, what would be unethical about uh, improving someone's body if they've uh, I, have a disability? I don't think there is. I mean, you know, you know, if we look at, you know, take the Lee Majors paradigm, if you lose your right. eye, um, maybe you'd want an eye that could uh, zoom in and... Uh, and uh, Right. See far away. I mean, would, uh, magnification. Would you have any issue with that? No, no, not okay. at all. I'm just kind of setting setting yeah, the yeah. table for some bodily autonomy there. I, but I, we can, see, we can, I, I see the breadcrumbs. We can we can revisit that later on. Uh, second sec second question for you. Mm -hmm. um, do you think it's possible to have a real relationship with a humanoid that knows that you're lying? Lying about what? Anything. In other words, you know, we're now at a point where. Um, LLMs, or actually not LLMs, but ANNs, uh, Advanced Neural Networks, can can look at data and, and analyze voice patterns to the point where they can um, uh, predict with over 95% uh, uh, predictability whether somebody, for instance, who's phoning into a suicide hotline is actually serious. So one has to believe that um, uh, similar kinds of networks are going to be able to tell whether or not uh, you're lying if they can't already. Um, so the question again okay. is, do you believe that you can have a real relationship with a humanoid that knows when you are lying? Yes, but it'll be different than human to human relationships. So in other words, we'll be tailoring our answers to somebody that knows. Well, that I mean, there are people who won't necessarily be telling white truths anymore. Uh, there'll be more well, honest. Think, it'll be a more honest relationship. To 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 answer this seriously, I think in all relationships, I think humans. One of the reasons we evolved our big brains was to understand social hierarchy and, uh, you know, understand the clues as to when people are telling the truth or are on, in our interest or are uh, bamboozling us. So I, I think um, I I don't believe that a neural network is going to be necessarily like you know so many orders of magnitude better at telling whether humans are lying. Than, uh, hum than some humans. So I think, you know, humans are already to do that. So I'm saying, I think, yes, you can have an ethical relationship with someone, with, with an entity of that sort, but you um, you have to be aware of its abilities. I mean, th this is this gets uh, back into almost the consciousness discussion because it's like you're modeling them, they're modeling you, you're modeling yourself, modeling them, and it becomes a recursive, recursive loop. But no, I don't see that as a, as a absolute barrier to having a, a, an honest relationship might even right. be uh, helpful it might even be helpful we know people who are good at telling whether other people are lying we also know people who are terrible at lying and people who are good at lying right there's a spectrum there and um i think if you could have a if you have you can have a relationship with a child who's not really good at lying partly because they just don't understand the world as well as you um but you can have an ethical relationship but it's it's not 
it's not a co-equal relationship, right? There's a there's a sort of a, a hierarchy to a relationship like that. And if somebody is incredibly intelligent and perceptive and someone else is somewhat lost in their own thinking, they're going to have a, an asymmetrical relationship. But I, I don't think moving to computers makes any of this any different. But, you know, that, 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 that you know, sort of informs uh, uh, the, the, the question about whether or not if AGI becomes so much more intelligent than us, then it's going to be like putting an orangutan in a cage with a, luring it with an right. orange. But um, let's go on to the third question, which, uh, again, this one's slightly more humorous, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Okay. Would you prefer it? If your child brought home for dinner a droid or a drummer, <laughs> I think a droid. <laughs> Drummers are bad news. I, I was in a band, so yes, <laughs> speak from experience. Um, okay, I All think right. you know it, it depends on what the you know what the, I I wouldn't absolutely I uh, reject it, but um I, I would wonder about it. <laughs> okay, um, uh, right. Let's move into uh, robot news. If we can sure. take a look at slide one. Big news of the week. Uh, the Tesla robot, um, which uh, Elon Musk says there'll be an army of. I don't think he used that word, but he said there'd be tens of thousands. And of course, we all knew that when he was creating his car company, he was in fact creating a robot company. Uh, mm -hmm. He says this Tesla is going to be cheap. And what he means by cheap is that it will cost $10,000 and that he will sell it for $20,000. So it's certainly a luxury item. As you can see, it's doing tasks in the kitchen, which I know is dear to your heart. Um, $20,000. What do you think? Well, I think it's bullshit. I, I don't <laughs> think he's, anyone's selling this thing for $20,000. I mean, he's said 30 at times. And, you know, I mean, we can all have our opinions of, uh, of, of that particular human. But, um, I think it's going to cost 50 to 100 grand to build these things. And I suspect if they want to move them into the home, I mean, right now, most of these humanoid companies are focused on warehouse work for the, for the, for partly for the reason that, that home work is uh, less, people can pay less and they expect more. Um, but as far as this, something like this Tesla or the figure one, I think what you're going to see is uh, rent. Uh, you know, lease arrangements like you have with automobiles. And this is one of the innovations that Ford came up with. I think it was, I think it was Ford, uh, you know, that he created relationships with banks to give people credit so that they could purchase this new expensive thing. Right. And the same uh, thing happened with, with, uh, with, with mainframe, some microcomputers also, yeah, and, they, and you know, say, they, they all got financed. You could almost say the same thing is true in the, in the smartphone market, right? I mean, these smartphones are are being given away with contracts, you know, and they're they're probably worth several hundred dollars to build, and uh, you know, so yeah, so the idea well, of like making something, uh, you know, on a long term payment plan. I want to touch on one, on a comment you just mentioned, which was uh, a lot of these things are going to be in warehouses. Uh, just a quick comment, which is um, which is a Goldman Sachs prediction, which is. The humanoid robotics market could be worth $38 billion by 2035. That's in 10 years. I will point out they are saying the vast majority of that is going to be in industrial and warehouse use. I think that's a bit slow. I think uh, the <laughs> industrial faster. warehouse use is going to be is going to grow pretty fast. But I actually think the home market, is, I, I think it's not going to be immediate. Um, but I think it's a serious market. It's bigger than the than the industrial market. I think. I mean, I'm not a marketing specialist, so we'd have to look into the what the facts are. But you know, everybody has a home, and nobody likes taking out the garbage. <laughs> That's what everybody said when we asked. Okay, if we can get slide number two. So this is the Galbot once again right. working in the kitchen, um, coming out of China. Um, price says, please call for details. I will say that, uh, in general, all humanoids right now that I am aware of, um, cost between 40 and $90,000 with the exception of the one we just saw the Tesla one, which doesn't actually exist yet, apparently. Uh, but this is the Galbot again, don't know how much it costs, but we can assume it's at least 40,000. Um, but there it is in the kitchen again, getting closer to the kinds of things that we're, you know, looking at. Hopefully, we'll be announcing our robot next week, which we're calling a minimum viable robot, an MVR, um, which is going to cost twenty five hundred bucks. But here we go, an uh, an upper body with two limbs. Uh, any comments on the Galbot? No, um, they they don't like to show the wheels. I guess they wish they had legs. Um, but you know, uh, 
a robot like this, I mean, there's a lot of actuators. It's going to be expensive to produce. But, you know, the wheeled base is cheaper than the than the legs and more stable. It's easier to do if it falls yeah. over, et cetera. Uh, okay, let's move on to the third one. The third one is a big announcement this week uh, from Physical Intelligence, Pi. Right. Um, well, they had already awesome. announced it. I'm sorry. They, they had announced it. What they did was open source it. Uh, right. And, and this, of course, is backed by a lot of people, including Sergey Levin. And uh, here we see it. Um, again, not cheap. But they have a lot of resources, a lot of people, and uh, here we go seeing them well, folding let me, laundry. You know, let me yeah. make a point about this. Um, they're not about the robots at all. I've I've taken a deep dive into their papers and their code, and um, they 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 work with six or seven different robot arms. The whole point of their uh, model is to make it agnostic to what robot is actually doing the work, as long as it has the capability. Uh, as you see, that's that's just a two two grip. Pincer, you know, I think we're familiar with that architecture. This is probably an expensive uh, industrial arm, but you could certainly make something cheaper because you don't need to have, you know, kilograms of. Uh, well, of in fact, the, what, what you just said, I'm sorry to interrupt, but what you just said sure. actually, did, um, they have not only um, released this, but they released it with a with a uh, one sentence policy. Uh, this was right. just, uh, and the policy is called our first generalist policy, and it says right. the following. Our first generalist policy for Pi Zero, a prototype model, uh, pr a prototype model that combines large-scale multitask and multi-robot data collection with a new network architecture to enable the most capable and dexterous generalist robot policy to date. So, yeah. not that far away from what we're saying, but of course nope. they are doing it with a lot more resources and they're going <laughs> to have a lot, lot higher price point. I mean, uh, as we can see, that's pretty significant what we're looking at right there. Uh, okay, uh, we're going to move uh, down market slightly now uh, to uh, Argula. Joe, if we can move to the next next one. So what what manufacturer so is this? This is Argula. What they've appeared to have done is taken a. They make the base, and they've taken right. an arm made by somebody else. Right. Avula, and that's it. It's a rolling right. base with an arm, which has one, two, three, four, five degrees of freedom. Six, Is that what probably. I'm seeing? Right? Six. It's got to be so six. So again, you know, a little more that getting closer to what we're doing, getting closer to our price point. But again, this one, I think we're looking at a at about ten thousand dollars for this for this, whatever it can do. Uh, have, I can't uh, imagine the arm has a significant payload. But well, um, they've got any, they've any, got a, they've got lidar on the base, so yeah. But, but that's gotten cheaper. But um. With one arm, I mean, you can't fold clothes, right? You can't really wash the dishes. Um, do you know what the? Uh, do you know if you can actually purchase this thing? Uh, no, nope. cool sales. Yeah, it's always cool uh, sales. I, 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 their, their, their real product is that base, um, and I believe okay. the arm is made by a third party. But again, you know, we're getting closer to uh, this minimum viable robot. Do you consider this to be a minimum viable robot? Yes, I do. I think it's okay. legitimately a minimum right. viable robot. I mean, it can do some things. So ten thousand dollars. So let's let's talk about something a little, uh, a, a little. You know, we're now, we're now looking at robots which are doing, you know, more of the things that we're talking about. We're of course introducing a robot, uh, possibly next episode, possibly the episode after, um, uh, yep. and it's a robot that we hope to introduce to the marketplace for a price of twenty five hundred dollars. Certainly for the first two hundred units that we're going to seed the market with and get feedback, uh, and then we're probably going to be selling them for I think thirty nine ninety nine, around four thousand dollars. Something significantly cheaper than anything we've looked at. Something certainly with more than one arm. Um, why don't you tell us about not necessarily our secrets, but about what it takes to get a robot down to that price point, and why nobody's done that up to this point, and why it's we're right. about to enter a sort of a golden age. Yeah, even if I it never quite hits those numbers, I think um, the the key is the number of, of degrees of freedom, the number of actuators. Uh, I mean, the CPUs are cheap now. Three um, D printing makes it easy to prototype. Um, the real cost point is the number of actuators, and one of the reasons we moved away from legged robots, which I had worked in previously, and we did some work when we first started this company. Um, is you need a minimum of 12 actuators to to run, you know, lower limbs and do bipedal stuff. Uh, you need more if it's a quadruped, actually. 
Um, so I, you know, I mean, that's, that's an expense. Sensors are getting cheaper. You know, I, th I think the, the, the physical motor, you know, energy, you know, electrical, uh, wiring and, and requirements are really what, what make these things expensive and development, you know, research and development, obviously, but that's amortized over, you know, scaling up in, in my, you know, I'm sure in all these business plans. Um, so on, on, that... on the software side, obviously there's software that yeah. you know about it doing things, but is there, is there any software that can be used to actually, uh, yeah, optimize well, some of the hardware components? Uh, yeah, we have, we have some ideas about that. Um, as I guess you know, <laughs> uh, so there are ways of uh, reducing the the number of parts, the complexity of the actuators, the way they do feedback. Uh, that's all. That's all open for um, for innovation. I think we we believe, um, and you know, it's the, the cost reduction is is really. It's also about scaling up and being you know able to manufacture at scale. Uh, and the cheaper you make it, the more you're going to sell, presumably. So so that can become an iterative process. I think another important aspect of this is that, uh, for instance, Pi Zero has actually open sourced their models, and uh, or rather their their <clears throat> their models and their code. Uh, and this open source means that a company like ours, without having to spend the development money, can leverage the sort of collective wisdom of the of the industry, and put a product out there the way Ubuntu puts out a Linux product, right? Or um, you know, Android is an open source operating system. So that I think levels the playing field to a large degree and makes it much easier for smaller entities such as ourselves to enter the market, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, well, I think so. I think we all think so. That's why we're yeah. all here. Okay. Well, well, thank you very much. I'm hoping that next time we're going to let people into our lab a little bit. Yeah. Uh, we're going to have to speak to our lab director and see. <laughs> uh, but I think we're, we're getting pretty close. So um, you may right. be seeing something uh, for episode four. Thank you all for watching. Bye. Oh, my. And...